All right, Chair Stewart. This is Anthony from HEP. I have all my de devices rolling, and the floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the regular meeting of the Planning Commission. It is Tuesday, April 6th, and it is 6 o'clock. We are holding this meeting via teleconference. Our chairperson, Jesse Barone, is not available, so I am taking charge tonight, and we have a quorum of commissioners. We'll start the meeting with a moment of silence. All right, thank you. And next up is planning commissioner announcements. Are there any announcements? Jen, was that your hand? Yeah, go ahead, hon. Okay, it's, it's not an announcement, but more of a thank you. Um, I attended the League of California Cities training, and I'm just really appreciative of the fact that our city um, let us you know that we were notified about it. I've heard otherwise from other commissioners and um, who were not so happy they weren't notified that there was this option um, and that our city you know was willing to provide that training for us. So I just wanted to extend my thank you to the city of Morro Bay. Um, um, for for giving me the opportunity to have that training. So thank you. Wonderful. Glad that you did that. I'd love to chat with you about it sometime. Okay, anybody else? Let's see, checking on Joe. We're okay. All right. Um, next up is public comment. Um, generally, this is comments on anything that's not on the agenda, but if you um, can't stay for the items that are on the agenda, you're welcome to comment now. Um, I believe we have the links posted, um, hopefully on the TV screen, and otherwise you can find them on the um, agenda on the city's website. I can share them if you want, Susan. Sure, why don't you share them? Okay. I'm seeing we have some people waiting in the um, list there. Anthony, are you seeing anybody with a hand up who wants to chat now? Um, Chair, I do not see any raised hands in the queue currently. Okay, all right, perfect, thank you. Sure. All right, moving on, do we have any presentations? We do not. Okay, then the next up would be our consent calendar. We have our current and advanced planning and processing list and the approval of minutes for the February 16th meeting. Do we have any comments, questions, or want to pull any of those items from the other commissioners? I have one. I'll raise my hand. <laughs> um, one or two. I was curious about the Haslow project. Um, planning approved on January 10th. Building disapproved on February 2nd. Is there um, an issue, a concern, or is that just a... Process. So they're in building plan check, and so we sent it to an outside plan check firm, which is Bureau Veritas, um, and they conducted that um, uh, outside plan check review, and then we we plan checked it internally as well through planning and uh, and building, uh, well, planning, building, and uh, fire, uh, and then they received and engineering, and they received comments back from I think all uh, sectors um, uh, that they need to address. So it's pretty common, especially for a project that's you know got thirty five units in it, that type of thing. So okay. Okay, just wanted to see where that was at. And then I also noticed um, uh, the Sonic Project's due date is coming up. They had an expiration date in April of 2021, so we heard anything from them. It is Cindy's project. I guess I could let her give you the update. Okay. Hi, um, yes, their planning permit that was approved by the Planning Commission um, is due to expire this month. And they um, uh, were notified by myself probably about two weeks ago, just as a courtesy email, that if they, um, that their permit was due to expire and if they wanted to request another extension, uh, they have exhausted all of their administrative ex extensions, um, which would be the director. Um, and any future extensions uh, would require the Planning Commission um, to approve that. Um, 
I have not heard anything from them, so um, I'm not quite sure where, where they were at. Uh, the last status was that they were in building plan check and, and they had gone through a couple of rounds of plan check. So they've been quiet for, um, you know, a year now or more. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Just curious about where that was at. And I'm glad to hear it would come back to planning commission because so many changes in the area suggest we might have a different approach to the project at this point. I don't know, you know, but yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So then do anybody else have any questions or no? Um, can I get a motion to approve the consent calendar? So moved. Thank you, Bill. And a second? I'll second. All right. I think we got a second from Joe and or Jen. Uh, all in favor? Oh, we probably need to do a roll call. We have to do, yeah, we have to do voice mode. Sorry. Um, so, uh, um, Commissioner Roshan? Uh, yes. Commissioner Grafia? Yes. Commissioner Ford? Yes. Vice Chair Stewart. Yes. Motion passes 4 zero. Thank you. All right. Moving on to our public hearings. We have item B1, um, MAJ 19-006, concept precise plan, site location 571 Embarcadero. And this, I think, is Cindy. It is. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, members of the Planning Commission. I do have a presentation. I'll pull it up right now. And here we go. Uh, this is a request for a major modification to an existing conditional use permit. Uh, the location is 571 Embarcadero, and you can see it there on the screen. And um, uh, the project before you, um, it is a commercial remodel, uh, including a conversion of existing second floor office space that is currently unused to uh, be converted to one vacation rental unit. It also includes uh, public coastal access improvements, uh, replacement of damaged dock and gangway, and uh, pilings to support the new um, public access and docks and gangways and related building facade improvements. The applicant is Rick Gambrell and the agent is Kathy Novak Consulting. Uh, the project is located in the waterfront zoning district. It's in a plan development overlay and S4 uh, treatment. Uh, the item before the planning commission is a conditional use permit approval. Uh, it is in the original jurisdiction of the coastal commission. So they would be required to get their coastal development permit from uh, the coastal commission. And because it's in a plan development overlay zone, our um, zoning code requires a concept precise plan approval process. And what that means is that uh, the planning commission will, um, should they uh, vote to approve this project, they would be forwarding a favorable recommendation to the city council for approval um, as a combined concept precise plan approval. And then the city council would have the authority for the final CUP uh, modification. And then, excuse me, a little detail on the proposed development. So as I said, this is a conversion of existing second floor office space and it um, would create one vacation rental unit and uh, also convert a portion of the first floor roof area to um, uh, deck space for uh, the rental unit guests, and then additionally in install a vertical chair lift uh, for ADA accessibility, and that would be located on the east side elevation. And I'll I'll show you some elevations in a few slides here. Uh, the second component of the project is an extension of the existing harbor walk, uh, which would pop out uh, approximately 207 square feet. The southwest portion, mostly of, of that existing harbor walk access, it would also widen the eight and a half foot access that's there currently uh, that runs from north to south from eight and a half feet to 10 feet. Uh, number three, uh, replace uh, two damaged finger docks uh, and realign an existing 20 
well, our previously existing 20-foot gangway uh, to a 28-foot gangway that would be parallel with the Harbor Walk. Uh, a recent King Tide event damaged those existing docks that were there uh, previously, and they were removed um, for um, emergency um, and safety reasons. Uh, to accommodate the um, extended finger docks, it would also include a 450-square-foot lease line amendment and um, replacement of two new pilings. Uh, the project also includes a request for approval of a mas master sign program, allowing a slight increase over what would uh, be allowed pursuant to our standard sign ordinance. So our sign ordinance is based on linear building frontage. Um, they would be allowed 67 and a half square feet. They were requesting almost 74 square feet. Uh, to give you a little bit of background, uh, so this project was actually um, a very similar project was um, recommended by Planning Commission for approval to City Council in 2018. And the Planning Commission adopted Resolution 3918. Um, it did not end up moving on to City Council and it, um, it lingered for a while. Um, because the applicant uh, encountered some building code challenges. And so now the project um, slightly revised is before you tonight. The key differences are that ADA lift, which was previously approved for the west side elevation has been moved to the east side, the street side elevation. And uh, it was previously two vacation rental units. So tonight's proposal is just one unit. Um, on the second floor. Uh, Planning Commission adopted five conditions and I've summarized them here on the screen. Uh, they are that uh, to remove the trash storage enclosure, to expose the brick facade, add signage for the public restroom, tone down the color of the directory sign, revise uh, lighting fixtures. Um, in this um, condition, the Planning Commission's um, Preference was for particular lighting condition or lighting fixtures to be changed. And uh, staff has included planning condition 13, which would require revised lighting fixtures. This is an item that is has not um, been met yet by the applicant. Um, and so you'll see that in planning condition 13. And then the last uh, condition by planning commission was to provide a CASP, sort of, uh, CASP ADA verification uh, on that chairlift. Uh, here is a, uh, the next few slides I have will uh, go through some of these site plan changes. So here's the existing first floor site plan, and it does show the previous existing docks here um, um, in white, actually. And they uh, do not currently exist because of the recent King Tide event that I mentioned. Um, and you can see that there is an existing public dining deck um, on the west side. And uh, this would be the proposed first floor site plan. This area here in gray, if you can see where my cursor is moving, uh, represents the, the area. And then um, um, this area over here, which represents the 207 square feet expansion. Uh, the existing second floor plan, uh, which shows the current office space um, and then revised uh, to show one ADA accessible vacation rental unit uh, with two private deck um, spaces for that uh, rental unit. And then here at the southeast corner of the building, it would be where the proposed ADA lift would be located. And then uh, this slide here shows the existing and proposed street elevations. On the west, or excuse me, on the right side of the screen, you can see here um, the brick uh, veneer finish of the ADA lift. And then the base side elevations, uh, which show um, the expanded harbor walk. I have some visual simulations that show, will show this a little bit clearer. Uh, here's the existing visual sim, and uh, which reflects also uh, the updated both coastal access signage and uh, business signage. So here is the proposed visual simulation and just, um, and then here is a zoomed in version of what um, you can see that um, brick um, ADA lift would look like. And then on the base side, uh, existing. Um, and then here you'll see um, 
the Harper Walk um, as it's expanded there. It right uh, currently, it kind of um, uh, goes in a diagonal direction as it heads south towards the Gray's Inn. Uh, the proposal would um, uh, widen it so there's a little bit more walking space. Uh, the applicant submitted a color and materials and the lighting information and um, at the bottom of the screen are the lighting fixtures A through E, which are discussed in the staff report. And it's uh, figures uh, B, C, and D here in the middle. Uh, that's staff's evaluation of the project uh, found that they weren't consistent with the uh, gym mall architecture style. At the, at the 2018 Planning Commission um, hearing, the Planning Commission uh, felt strongly that uh, they really wanted to see uh, the plans were revised so that it would expose um, all five of the brick columns along the street and really be consistent with that original architecture by this uh, local architect. Uh, the sign program approval, um, as stated previously, they are requesting approximately 74 square feet in total signage for uh, the building. And uh, the conditional use permit a process um, does allow for this process to request that additional signage along with the CUP approval. Um, and it would also be cons consistent their proposal tonight uh, with our draft sign ordinance, which has uh, not yet been adopted, but um, it does require uh, when there are multi-tenant commercial building spaces that uh, master sign program um, approval be um, uh, uh, required, and that's uh, what they are proposing here. In the downtown waterfront plan, it encourages projecting signs. The applicant's proposal would include a directory sign as well as individual projecting signs for each of the tenants um, on the first floor. Uh, the public access signs are proposed to be updated. Uh, they currently do not include the Morro Bay Harbor Walk branding. Uh, and here, the sign on the left would show you what that would look like. Uh, this is consistent with the other uh, lease sites on the waterfront. And then the, the directory sign, um, this was one of the conditions Planning Commission previously had. The original proposal was that this background color on this directory sign was uh, white. Uh, and they requested that that be toned down. Um, applicant's proposal um, is now showing that with a beige color. Um, here are some images that show um, examples of those projecting signs uh, for the commercial lease sites. Uh, this shows the existing signs to be approved. There's um, a collection of uh, whimsical signs, if you will, throughout the property, uh, including the ice cream signs um, and a variety of tenant spaces. Uh, for the development standards, uh, the applicant's not requesting any exceptions. They're not proposing any increase in height. Um, although it does not um, meet the existing view corridor requirements that would typically be required on new waterfront projects, um, this is an existing building that predates the waterfront master plan. Um, so um, while it does have that um, narrow view corridor, um, the walkway to the uh, bay of the of the west side of the building. They are proposing to remove the um, tables that line um, the view corridor currently. And so that should um, improve line of sight. Uh, for environmental review, uh, the staff review of the project determined that it would be exempt under California Environmental Quality Act uh, as a commercial remodel project. Uh, they are um, have been conditioned to perform um, uh, pre-construction eelgrass um, surveys um, and be consistent with um, Army Corps requirements and California environmental, or excuse me, the CAMP, California eelgrass mitigation plan. And those are reflected in planning conditions seven through 10. So with that, staff's recommendation is that um, the Planning Commission forward a favorable recommendation to the City Council to conditionally approve the project uh, as reflected in or by adopting Planning Commission Resolution 0721 uh, for the project depicted on plans received March 12th, 2021. And that concludes my presentation. I am happy to answer any questions. And I think you are muted, Susan. Excuse 
me, Chairperson. You're all right. It's yes. okay. You can call me. Um, thank you. Um, before we get to questions, is there any ex parte? I uh, myself met on site with Kathy Novak and, and had a little tour of the project. Anybody else? Yeah, likewise. I know with Kathy. Perfect. Thank you. All right. And any questions for staff? Yeah, I, I had just one question. Um, the, the, the apartment that they're going to build is pretty good size. I was wondering, what would, any safeguards that it should only be a vacation rental short term as opposed to a, a, a permanent uh, residency, you know, full time? I, I wonder how, we, how that might be assured. Does anybody have any ideas? Um, how would so the question is how would we ensure that it maintain that it's um, utilized as a vacation rental? Well, I, yeah, ensure it's a too strong word. I'm I'm just wondering uh, how we as a as a group can get any kind of assurance. Is it just a matter of relying on the landlord that it won't be rented um, for anything over thirty days, or is there a you know some sort of policing going on? Or so, I mean, they, they would be required to get a vacation rental license from City Hall. Um, Harbor Department manages those lease sites, so that's part of their lease management um, oversight functions. Um, and that's, um, in short, really, um, how that um, ensures that it's not rented for periods longer than 30 days. I, I think also, um, as part of the vacation rental ordinance, unless it got changed, if there is an underreporting of revenues within the calendar year, um, aside from, say, a pandemic situation, uh, they would lose their license. Mm -hmm. So well, that might, might be a safeguard as well. Yeah, I mean, I think if for, for this for this particular project, um, you know, they're going to get a their vacation rental license, and those are renewable every year. And so we can, we can check in on these, every, you know, when they do the renewal process, and we check in on the amount of TOT that they uh, report. And in fact, we um, uh, we have a service through host compliance where we can see the, the number of rentals that were posted um, for any given property in the city. And so we can match those to the revenue totals, you know, as, as a kind of, you know, audit if we want to, um, to at least get a rough approximation. You know, it's not, a, it's not an actual audit, you know, we don't have folks coming in and looking at their books, but we can see how often it's rented and then we can compare that to the amount of DOT they're reporting. Okay. And it's, and it, you're approving it as this, so that's the use. They can't use it for anything else. <laughs> so if they did, it would be a violation of the municipal code. So. Any other questions for staff? Jen, Commissioner um, Ford, <laughs> that's okay. Um, so my questions are, I don't know, maybe it's actually more for Kathy. Um, they actually, they came up today for me. Um, I went to get a last minute coffee before we started this meeting and I um, stopped by to see if Skipper's Brew was open, but they weren't. I, I forgot that they closed at three, but um, I went there and I, um, I couldn't get through the hallway because bikes were lined up through the hall and blocking my way through the hallway. And so I looked around and I noticed there wasn't any type of bike parking or a lockup in anything in that area, in that region. And so um, just as maybe something to just bring light to, I don't know that it necessarily has to be, you know, in the conditional use permit, but I think that it's something that's important for the builders to recognize that this could be an issue. And then um, the second thing is, um, even though I've been in this building so many times, um, the restroom, even though I know it's there, I happen to notice that today the Beach Burgers door was open and it blocks almost the entire walkway to the restroom. And there's only about a two foot walkway to that bathroom and so it's not even visible um unless you're looking for it and you peek your head through the hole and you can you know the opening and see that there's a bathroom there i know it will be labeled and they'll you know people can find it but it's not very accessible if that door is open so those are just two observations that i had above and beyond questions i've already asked staff so um just wanted to bring those up Thanks. Um, there is a bike rack actually on the Harbor Walk, I believe. So, but you know, that's a good point. Maybe there needs to be one out on the sidewalk, um, some safe place for lockup. 
Okay, so I think we can open for public comment now, and um, I believe we do have Ms. Novak with her hand up. Anthony, can we have yes, Kathy Novak join absolutely, us? Absolutely, Chair. Let me go ahead. Okay, Kathy, you are unmuted. Good evening, Vice Chair Stewart and Commissioners. My name is Kathy Novak, and I'm here tonight representing the applicant for the 571 Embarcadero Road Project, also known as the Salt Building. Before I begin, I'd like to thank staff for their time and assistance with this project and the, for the favorable recommendation for council. Staff has provided a detailed project overview, and I know a couple of you were on the commission previously, so I'll be brief with my comments and just go over a few items in a snippet of history. As staff mentioned, the previous project that was approved by the Planning Commission for, was for two retail units on the second floor, public access, and an ADA lift at the rear of the building, but it did not move forward to council. So unfortunately, the building code changed in the interim, and the new requirement was two units, two ADA accessible units on an accessible path. So this caused the applicant to reevaluate the project, and he put them on hold. Uh, just recently, during the, one of the King Tide events, the gangway and floating docks suffered major damage, and the applicant was forced to remove all of this to prevent any further problems or damage to the boats or other docks. After that event, the applicant decided to look at the vacation and rental concept once again. It was decided that the ADA unit on the second floor would be the best option as trying to have uh, two as cause, uh, excuse me, it, that would be the best option because two would have caused layout issues with the upstairs. So tonight the project presented to you has one ADA unit on the second floor, the Harbor Walk extension and the replacement of the floating docks and gangway. Before we submitted the project, we worked closely with staff on the location of the ADA lift. There are a couple of reasons for selecting this location. First, it makes better accessible sense from the ground level to the upstairs. Second, it significantly provides better protection from the elements. And I'll note here that the existing lift in the rear is for only from the ground level to the harbor walk and is a constant maintenance problem since it's subject to salt air, windblown sand, and et cetera. And third, it will not interfere with any views from the neighboring Gray's Inn as the first proposal did. Staff recommended that we, with this new lift that was on the Embarcadero side, that we figure out a facade that would blend in with the existing building architecture. So we presented two options to the commission for tonight for the consideration. The first option is a, f a brick facade that you can see in the simulation on your sheet A5.1. The second option is a wood facade that you have that's in your report as Exhibit F. So we were asking the commission for your preferences to which facade you believe fits the, build, the existing building the best. The last item I want to share about the lift is that during the previous planning commission meeting, there was concern about the type of lift and it was for, if it was for commercial purposes. I believe that this discussion led to the added condition number 18 for the requirement of the CASP report. Since that time, we've looked closely at the ADA lifts and have had conversations with the building inspector, and we know that the lift as proposed tonight is a commercial lift and will meet the requirements. Additionally, the construction drawings, when done, will show any requirements for slopes or other items that will need to be done to meet the ADA standards. As such, I will ask you for a friendly amendment to the project conditions to delete number 18 and not require any special ADA reports. The balance of the project includes some notable components, which are one, the new master sign program. The signs proposed tonight are the same as previously approved with one minor change having to do with the sign board color to beige. This is something that the commission requested at the time. For the other new commissioners, I'll just note that the sign program was designed in consultation with staff to meet the new standards of the city that the city is wanting. Two, a 50 square foot reduction of the storage area on the Embarcadero side, opening the area as the commission had requested. Three is a new gangway that has been realigned to a north-south orientation. This modification has now allowed the applicant to add a two-foot addition to the existing harbor walk along the windscreen area, which will make the access way 10 feet. 
and a new 207 square foot harbor walk extension on the southern side. Number four, furthermore, an eight and a half foot head float will be constructed to allow more space to walk around the gangway. Five, the finger docks will be lengthened by approximately 10 feet and repositioned so that the new overall design will provide a better slip configuration. And six, and last, a lease line will be adjusted by approximately 450 square feet to include the new floating dock footprint. There are additional project details, but since they are included in your staff report in Exhibit C and D, I don't think it's really necessary for me to cover them all. I would prefer to answer any specific questions you might have rather than taking more presentation time. I do have one more request for the project conditions uh, and a change that is for planning commission uh, condition number 10. This will be on page 37 of your report. The condition is in regards to the eelgrass surveys. I'll be asking you to add the following language to the first sentence, quote, unless otherwise waived under the Army Corps permitting requirements, end quote. If the federal agencies that the federal agencies that administer the camp allow a waiver to for a pre-construction eelgrass survey, since the area has had no reported eelgrasses in the past 10 years, I would like the applicant to have the ability to forego the survey and not just be required by the city and no one else. This concludes my presentation. I would like to say thanks to the applicant that has amended the project to include the previous uh, Planning Commission comments the best he can while proposing a workable and constructible project. We believe this is all in keeping with the existing character of the building with minimal exterior modifications and no increase to height. It also meets the city goals, plans, and other policies. On behalf of Mr. Gambrell, I would like to respectfully ask the commission's recommendation for approval of this project as presented tonight. I do have uh, Gene Dowdy and Tom Jess with me on tonight. The, Tom is the architectural uh, person and Gene was the one that did the dock uh, design. So if you have any technical questions, we can uh, get them on. I'd like to thank you for your time and maybe I can just hit uh, Jen uh, on your comment on the bike parking. I guess my only concern is just do we have enough room? Uh, there's the one bike uh, that Susan mentioned on the Harbor Walk already. That's on the next door lease site, but I'm not sure that it would be appropriate place. I know that the city's new LCP update, they're talking about not having any amenities within the 10-foot section, so this could be problematic the way it's coming from your new LCP requirements. And then out to the sidewalk, there's really not a whole lot of room. We do have that little section, but we're, when we put the ADA lift in there, that's going to be... Uh, you know, reducing that space. And then we go over toward the storage shed and there's a ramp there, and there's gas meters. So I did, I'm not really think of anything that we can do there just because of the limited space. Um, and the beach burger door, I, geez, I don't know what to say. You know, the, the door's got to swing a certain way for people to get in. And it's probably uh, one of those original design flaws that somebody didn't really stop to think about that when the door was open, you were going to block that area. And I, unless Tom, Jess has got any uh, wild ideas, I'm not sure that there's anything we could do about that design. We will have that new public uh, restroom sign up. So hopefully that will help too. So with that, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that any of the commissioners may have. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Novak. Um, let's see if we have any other public comment on this item before we have commissioner questions. I see uh, Betty Winholtz with her hand up. Yes, Chair. Anthony, I'm can go we ahead get and unmute Betty right now? Perfect. Okay, Betty, you are unmuted. Thank you. This is Betty Winholtz. I just wanted to say with regard to the letter that I sent you this morning that it was in a sense a reminder um, because I felt what had happened on the previous project with regard to lifts or elevators was not necessarily serving the public and that you were looking at the minimum legal requirements rather than what would actually serve uh, the people of Morro Bay. That I, I hope you know you're not limited to the minimum of what the law requires, but that you can do more than that. Whether that's about this lift or eelgrass or whatever it is, I hope you know that you have a, 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 a broad span of decision making that's not limited to just legal requirements. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Winholtz. And I see Sean Green also has a hand up. Yes, Chair. Okay, Sean, I've unmuted you. 
thanks commission and staff and and the applicant as well for um, bringing up some of the questions that i had already about this property i uh, just want to make a couple quick comments um First off, just because Betty mentioned it, I think that the that federal standards historically in California are lower than what we have here in California. So if there is a, a more local jurisdiction on the eel grass, that we should really defer to that. Um, uh, second, um, it, uh, I think, you know, from a public perspective, it would be nice. Uh, this is more of a... Um, a general suggestion for staff, uh, it would be great to receive a frequent update, whether it's annual, whether it's quarterly, on some of these waterfront projects. I know a lot of time was spent on this project back in 2018, and then it kind of disappears and not much happens and we don't really hear about it. So we just have kind of blind faith that something's happening and then nothing happens. And then we have a, a meeting three years later. Uh, some uh, Kayak Horizons, Off the Hook, the Aquarium Building, these would be great projects to hear. Uh, you know, an informal quarterly update or something like that. Um, regarding the on-site bathroom, uh, I would like to know from staff, is this a mandated public bathroom? Uh, and if it is, uh, I know that, you know, when I recently walked by, uh, it was out of order as are 90% of the public bathrooms on the waterfront. Um, probably not coincidentally. Uh, and that's certainly problematic. Um, that goes, uh, that, that transitions into so, some of the comments that I have about ongoing jurisdiction over, um, over waterfront leaseholders keeping with the, the, the conditions of their CUPs. Um, I have great confidence in planning commission making decisions up front that that best suit the public uh, but i don't have much confidence in the ongoing maintenance of those conditions and so um whether that be obstacles in lateral and vertical access ways um, whether that be a use of a property that's behind closed doors and we don't ever see what's going in or out of that property um uh, that also goes for um uh, five-year audits are required as part of the uh, Tidelands Trust for any property that is a percent gross property, which this one is. So uh, to my knowledge, that's not happening. I'm not sure whether it is or not. Um, I do think that that's relevant when it comes to planning commission decisions. So if that is a requirement of the Tidelands Trust, it would seem to be relevant uh, for that to come to staff just to make sure that that is actually happening. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Thank you very much. Uh, good luck in your debate. Thanks, Mr. Green. I don't see anybody else with their hand up. Anthony, do you see anyone? Uh, thank you, Chair. No, I do not see any raised hands left in the queue. All right, so let's bring it back to the commission. All right, any questions for the applicant or for staff at this point? Mr. Roshan. So a quick question for uh, the applicant. Uh, Kathy, you're giving us an option on uh, one brick, two wood. Um, does the architect have a, uh, a preference in those options and why? Let me, uh, if Tom Jess is on, I'll let Tom uh, answer that question. So he was uh, doing the building design. Thank you. Hey, good evening. This is Tom Jess. Um, muted you. Um, yeah, so um, we did have a couple options. One was the brick, which was what we initially proposed. And then um, in thinking about it, we had those five brick columns out front that were kind of the, the statement pieces there. And we thought that maybe the, the wood would be downplayed a little bit more and not compete with the, the brick. So that was the reason for the second alternative. Do you have a preference, Tom? My preference would be the wood, actually. It was brought up after the initial submittal, and um, we just feel like it, it's more in keeping with keeping the, the strong rhythm that's there and staying in the language that was established by the original architect. Great. Thank you. Susan, that's my big question. Um, do, Kathy, do either you or Tom want to address... Um, the lighting issue and um, your concerns about choices for appropriate lighting um, that that relates to its purpose in the areas. I know, Kathy, you had mentioned some things about that. Right? 
I'll let Tom jump on that one too if he's still there. I am. Perfect. Yeah. So, um, so initially we had trouble finding because those are those are kind of handcrafted light fixtures which don't necessarily comply with the new energy requirements and the um, some of the other requirements that have come on since this building was originally designed. So what we thought about, and it's not reflected in the drawings, we, we kind of thought about it recently afterwards. So what we, what our initial thought was what we need to stick with a manufactured light fixture that we can get that has photometrics, that has all the testing that's associated with it, that's required to comply with it. But one of the thoughts we thought, and that's why the conditions in there, we're not questioning the condition, is what we thought we would do is um, use the manufactured light fixture, but but trim it out with some additional wood trim that matches those existing fixtures that are there. And we feel like we can work with staff and, and get that addressed and, and comply with the condition and, and the building will look better for it. Great, thank you. Any other mm -hmm. questions? Not seeing anybody. Uh, Bill, were you, you're muted, Bill. There you go. I, have a, uh, I forgot a couple of questions for staff. I think this might be the right time to ask Scott and Cindy. Um, I was hoping you could speak a little bit to the issue on the elevator um, because I'm concerned. I don't think commission has quite the leverage that Betty is suggesting in her letter. I'm wondering if you could inform us on that. And then also if you could talk a little bit about Sean's question, which sounds to me that it's about enforcement and maintenance, uh, both on the uh, horizontal access and the bathrooms. Could you address those two points? Um, sure. Um, so as it relates to, you know, the ADA, that's, that's um, you know, building code requirements. Um, that's really not a realm that the Planning Commission should typically get involved with. Um, you know, those are, those are code requirements, um, and there are very specific requirements that relate to the, you know, the project that Betty referred to in the, uh, the affordable housing project over on uh, Tuscadero Road that Betty referred to, and that not having an elevator and then pointing out that this one has one and we're requiring them to have one. Well, that the, the project on Tascadero Road is different in that it has accessibility on the lower floors and doesn't need an elevator. And this one does not have accessibility to a unit on the lower floor. It has the unit upstairs and has to have then has to have a lift. But um, you know, per, you know, Commissioner Roshan's you know question. That's typically not something the Planning Commission you know gets involved with. I will say you know in more recent times because um, one of the members of the Planning Commission, Jesse Barone, was a, a, a previous building inspector and then plans examiner. Like he oftentimes would bring up building code issues just in kind of conjunction with projects and things. But that's not a typical thing Planning Commissions usually um, you know weigh in on because um, those are usually you know predicated on um, code analysis and code compliance. <laughs> Um, as for the, um, you know, the maintenance, uh, you know, issue related to conditions and, and, and properties and, and access, those are all good points that, that, that Sean raises. And you've, um, you all seen, you know, the, the previous emails from Sean, you know, speaking to this issue. It's, you know, it's one that we certainly struggle with. We have a um, sort of lack of capacity on the code enforcement side of things. Our leases, you know, and, and policies do require the Harbor Department to conduct audits every five years. They also have a capacity issue and haven't been able to do that. Um, I think the idea is now with a new lease policy that's been put together is to start doing those audits. Um, we do go out on enforcement when we get um, complaints. Um, and we were doing uh, related to bathrooms previously anyway. Um, they, every time when we get into the busier season, we get complaints on those and then code enforcement goes out and talks to folks. Um, we've been trying to be a little more proactive as it relates to the bathrooms. That's a big issue down on the waterfront, especially when we're busy like this. And um, we started with Eric uh, Andersby, the Harbor Director, and he was, you know, because it's a requirement, you have to be compliant with the conditions of approval for your projects. <laughs> Leases that they all entered into say that they will, you know, comply with those things. And so we started with Eric. Um, and he's been having ongoing conversations over the last couple of weeks with our leaseholders um, to varying degrees of success. Um, the next step in this will likely be code enforcement, you know, getting involved and requiring those spaces to be open. Um, if people don't open them, then there's a the potential for citations to be issued and those types of things. We'd like not to go down that road, you know, with our business folks. We don't have to, but they do need to get, we do need to get the bathrooms open, especially with the amount of activity we have down there. And uh, staff certainly realizes that. And we actually had a, you know, part of the um, 
our emergency operations center meeting today, um, we talked about that, <laughs> um, you know, and what the status of that was. So uh, certainly um, timely comments and one that all a staff is, you know, paying attention to. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks, Scott. And, and uh, I want to thank Betty and Sean for the letters and um, my opinion that this is important to the commission um, enforcement is always a tough issue and wherever the commission can help um, i think uh, i'll speak for myself i'm interested my guess is the commission is interested as well thank you bill uh any other questions we'll check up here it's for it is quiet. Okay. Um, there were a few um, requests and, and concerns and issues that were brought up. So the eelgrass condition was one of them. Um, I know in talking with Ms. Novak, she indicated that since this project has been ongoing, they have been monitoring the eelgrass for a number of years now, and there hasn't been any in this location, partly because of the previous coverage of um, the Harbor Walk and the docks. Um, how do other commissioners feel about her suggestion of the additional language um, that they would do, um, let's see, would be subject to the California eelgrass mitigation policy requiring the pre-construction survey be completed within 30 to 60 days unless it was waived under the Army Corps permitting requirements. Does anybody have an issue with that? Yes, Mr. Rocha. Um I'm, support, I'm supportive of uh, Kathy's uh, request, unless I hear from Scott otherwise. Any concerns, Scott? I, I don't really have any concerns. The Army Corps is the resource agency that deals with the eelgrass issues. Um, and they're also going to have to go, there's another resource agency that they have to go to get permits from, and that's the Coastal Commission. Um, and uh, if the Coastal Commission is, is unhappy with that, they'll put the condition right back into it. Um, it's not... It's not like, well, but the condition's there, we enforce it, but it's we're enforcing it for these resource agencies, um, basically. So I, I don't have a concern with it. I, you know, I, I sort of track what uh, Ms. Novak is saying and, and, and don't, if the resource agencies are okay with it, then I, I certainly don't have an issue. Thanks. Um, let's see. The sign program, of course, would be one where they're asking for additional um, square footage, but it, it, it appears to me to be um, appropriately done. Um, so does anybody have any concerns with that? No? Okay. Just double check y'all here. Okay. Um, and then the lighting fixtures. Um, so type of lighting fixtures to be submitted to planning division for review. Um, the, the whole existing lighting fixture shall be revised to be consistent with the Jim Mall architectural style. And, and I'm very comfortable with their response that the lighting fixtures need to be appropriate to the current technology and those requirements, but that they would trim them out to kind of reflect that style. Does anybody have any other concerns or issues with that? Staff is also happy to work with them in that manner. That seemed a yeah. very reasonable uh, suggestion to me. Absolutely. Um, I, I do want to pause right there. And sure. you know, we had the issue related to the you know the bathroom and the door. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think maybe if the commission's okay with it, I'm I'm happy you know for Cindy and I to work with the applicant to maybe move the bathroom sign so we can have an, or have another one that's next to that location. Um, you know, so that if that happens then you would still have a sign that's right there that, t that tells you that the bathroom's there. And that's not what I think is shown on the sign plan. So uh, maybe we could add a sign that does that. At least, you know, it, it addresses the issue that was raised. And I think that is an issue. So um, that might be a, a resolution. That seems good. I remember going there when it was the Hofbrau <laughs> years and years ago. And yeah. that bathroom was always hidden. But I think the Hofbrau was a local's place and the locals knew where the bathroom was. <laughs> so they knew how to get behind that door. Um, but it, it's just, I think, um, you know, the architect's right. It's, it's one of those structural things that was perhaps not fully 
thought through when it was first built. Um, let's see. Um, the CASP certification or verification. Um, is that something that we can eliminate from the um, conditions? Um, the, if the commission's um, happy with that, I'm fine with the with the we're removing the condition. I don't have a problem with that. Yeah, I, we've, already, we've already reviewed it and looked at the the lift that they're proposing, and we're comfortable that it's compliant. Yeah, it seems logical to me um, not to put extra conditions that just make more work. Okay, anything that I missed? Did you get the ADA survey? Survey? Are we good? Is that what you were bringing up? That was the yeah, the certified okay. access special. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, any other feelings? Um, I would agree with Commissioner Roshan on um, and the architect on wood over brick on the surfacing on the lift. I, I think that would sort of cause that to recede a little. Um, but anybody else who has a strong opinion, I'm happy to hear. No, that, that's I, my, that's not my opinion exactly. I would prefer the one to more keeping. Excellent, and I see Jen nodding. Okay. It, you know, I do. I do have you know one thought in terms of the the uh, major um, lessee uh, self policing uh, of the of the areas. Um, you know, I, you know, I'm sensitive to the to the to the fact that the, the you know, budget constraints and the community development office. You know, and it, it, it wouldn't be out of the ordinary, you know, for, for planning commissioners you know, uh, to, to, on some sort of regular basis, stroll through the Embarcadero. I mean, I certainly don't have any expertise, but I can tell when there are chairs in a walkway that shouldn't be there, or if it looks to me like there's too many signs or the bathroom doesn't work. Um, and maybe that's all it takes to encourage um, the, the uh, major lessees to, to do a better job of, of keeping those things clear. Because, you know, I, I I sympathize with the actual business operators because, you know, if you're trying to observe the fine points of the lease with respect to this and your neighbor isn't, then to some degree you feel, you know, foolish for uh, observing the letter of the lease and you'd sort of like to reward them for observing the lease uh, rather than, uh, you know, rewarding those who aren't quite so scrupulous. I, I, just, I just sort of throw it out there. And, you know, it might be, there might be some legal prohibitions against it, but I don't think it would be that much more onerous for, for we as planning commissioners just once in a while to stroll the area and keep an eye on things. I think it may be a, a new or an additional challenge at this point because the, the pandemic um, allowed a, a, quite an excess of outdoor dining and seating and tables, and it was necessary and important. And I think um, it's actually in many areas created just the kind of ambiance that we really had been seeking. Um, and yet it has in some areas created quite a, a clutter. I will also say um, even on my sidewalk, there are times when a, a family group or a crowd will come through on bicycles and they leave all the bicycles, you know, sprawled across the sidewalk. And, and it, so that's not entirely a business owners or, or operators challenge it's just sort of a specific use thing that does happen um the, the the bathroom issue i would say just from the business perspective may relate to the pandemic as well i think there are a lot of business owners who have been tasked with keeping bathrooms clean and stocked and there's a certain amount of fear that's gone has gone along with that and not really knowing how to keep their employees safe if they are required to go in and do that cleaning and restocking. So um, perhaps a little more support and education in those areas could be helpful for them because we need restrooms. Yeah. Well, I would also note that it's likely coming out of the next budgetary process. And if we get the um, short-term rental ordinance approved, we'll be um, adding um, code enforcement staff um, that could help with this. Um, so um, that will be coming down the, the pipeline a little ways down the road. Not really super useful now though. <laughs> and we need it right now. So I'm just pointing that out. All right, thank you. Okay, so do we have any other discussion, concerns? Can I get a clarification? Yes. So um, 
would am, am I hearing that perhaps you might want to revise condition 15 regarding the restroom so that instead of saying add signage for on-site public restroom it would read add signage for on-site public restroom and relocate sign to improve visibility or something like that yes, that sounds good yeah and then you got that we felt we could eliminate 18, 18. yeah and um i don't know if 13 really needs to be revised about the lighting because i think if if they put in appropriate lighting fixtures but trim them to be consistent with the gym mall style that sort of answers that right yeah and, and we're, we're happy to work with the architect and um and and right now it kind of gives them a little bit of leeway on exactly how they're going to trim that out so um and then did you get the wording on number 10 for the eelgrass yes we got that all right anything else so can we get a motion susan real quick yes on that signage for the bathroom um would it hurt to make it that pub style also like all the other signage that's going in so it's really visible for people to see as they're looking down the hall you know seeing that public restroom just to be in uniform with all the signage that they're proposing that they're putting on the hall it's just a suggestion Nothing, I, you know. I, I like it i don't know what staff thinks i like it too okay. I, think, I think that's a good idea yeah. yeah i love pub signs okay that sounds good all right anybody got a motion all right mr ocean commissioner ocean as the uh, sun sets in beautiful Morro Bay behind me, um, I uh, would like to recommend uh, approval per staff's recommendations with the uh, adjustments that Kathy mentioned, um, the three on the ADA, the sign increase, the grass, and looking for the wood option. And finally, staff will work uh, with the applicant on the bathroom sign. That would be resolution number. Mm, this is case number MAJ19006. And PC07, let's see. Yeah. Okay, we got it. 21. And is there a second? I'll second it. Thank you. All right, let's call the roll. Commissioner Ingrafia? Yes. Commissioner Broshin? Yes. Commissioner Ford? Yes. Um, Vice Chairperson Stewart? <laughs> it's or, a mouthful, sorry. yes. Vice Chairperson Stewart? <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, Matt. the motion passes 4-0. All right, moving along, um, new business. Discussion and assignment of a replacement for Jesse Barone on the Planning Commission Development Review Subcommittee. The city is committed to undertake an evaluation of its development review process with the intent to improve and streamline the process. The subcommittee may participate in a larger stakeholder group that will be formed for the same purpose. Um, there is no staff report. Scott, have you got any other um, you know, as we're all aware, you know, this was to be Jesse's last meeting. Apparently, the last meeting was his last meeting. Um, and he, if you, you all recall, uh, last time I brought this item forward, the, the subcommittee was um, uh, comprised of uh, Commissioner Roshan and Commissioner Barone. So I am sh shy one person. We haven't actually started the work yet. I've uh, been a little busy with GPLCP stuff, but do plan on jumping right in, coming within the next probably week or so. I'm going to work with the subcommittee to, to set a meeting, probably have a meeting or two, and then form the larger, you know, stakeholder group with the committee as part of that. Um, and that stakeholder group would probably consist of folks that submit applications across our front counter. Um, so the folks that interact with us regularly are folks that have a lot of experience with that, um, you know, to help, uh, you know, us work through, you know, what improvements um, we can be, that can be made. So that's kind of the idea. Um, I envision, you know, again, maybe a meeting or two just with the subcommittee and myself, and then, um, and then when we form the larger sort of stakeholder group, um, probably 
three or four meetings with them, and then we'll have the you know the results of that come out, and that's when we would move forward to go and implement. It, that's kind of the way I have it framed in my head. That's subject to you know revision once I get to sit down with the uh, subcommittee and talk with them because I'm not making the decisions for everybody. I want to you know bring everybody in and see what they have to say. So I need another volunteer. <laughs> I guess is what I'm asking for. All right, I see you all jumping up and down and really excited. Joe, yes, yeah. Joe, yeah. win. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm, I'm retired and I, I have time. I'm certainly willing to do it. If someone else has a proclivity to really want to do it, fine, I'll defer, but I'm available. Hey, Joe, it's really going to be fun. They all <laughs> missed the chance here. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Bye. Thank you, Joe. Ah, well, I guess I appreciate it, Commissioner Agrafia. Thank you. And we didn't need to open that for public comment, did we? Uh, it, well, it's, it's a business item on the agenda, I suppose. Yeah, let's see. Uh, any Anthony, is anybody, I don't see anybody raising their hand on that, jumping up and down. Uh, that was, I'm, I'm jumping up and down right now. I'm joking. Um, um, <laughs> Anthony see, wants to do it. Yay! Yeah. Raise hands in the queue currently. Um, what I meant by that is I was doing jumping jacks. So, um, but <laughs> any means, actually jumping. <laughs> keep the blood going, Anthony. Stay awake. All right. Um, no raised hands in the queue. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. All there. right. Moving on. Unfinished business. Well, it's all kind of unfinished, or at least a lot of it. Um, when is, well, I suppose that would be comments and future agenda items. When is city council looking at the general plan? Well, that is a good question, uh, Vice Chair Stewart. They are going to start their review um, at their um, second meeting in April, which is the 27th. Um, it looks like they're going to take a little deeper dive into it than they initially had planned. And I think we're scheduling it out for three meetings. Um, so uh, I hopefully they're consecutive. Um, so that would be the 27th, 11th, and 25th, uh, assuming we need all three. Um, and we'll probably be biting off chunks because the city council has a lot of items on their agenda that they have to get through and we can't just sit there and blow through it all night like uh, the planning commission was able to. Um, you know, so, so it's looking like probably a three meeting process um, that we're looking at right now. Okay. All right. Um, other comments and suggestions for future agenda items? I see Joe and, excuse me, Mr. Uh, Chair, <laughs> Commissioner Ingrafia and Commissioner Roshan. Let's get Commissioner Ingrafia. You know, um, you know, per the, the, the business that was before us today, I, I, I had an interesting conversation with Kathy when we were talking in general terms about the eelgrass situation in the back bay and and it's a rather dramatic die off a few years ago and now it's coming back and, and the conclusion that there the doesn't seem to be a definitive study as to why that happened and why it's coming back now and that these are, and I, she mentioned that one of the cities down south i'm not sure if it was pismo and conducted a study but it was very expensive and I, you know i wonder if we could suggest to, that to the city council that we put together some kind of a volunteer subcommittee, um, you know, that might include somebody who has experience in writing the grants, maybe enlist somebody from the uh, from Cal Poly has some expertise in eelgrass, somebody from elected official, you know, like a small group. You know, maybe we could get this kind of a study done at a much reduced rate, or or the use of federal money. It strikes me that the federal government has an interest in keeping the bay healthy and alive. Um, and then, you know, the, these, these, uh, the concerns about, you know, the die off of eelgrass around the Embarcadero could be addressed in terms of those in lieu fees. And perhaps this study could tell us, you know, where and what to do with this in lieu money to keep eelgrass alive in places where it could actually do some good uh, in terms of keeping the bay clean. Just a thought. That is um, one of the implementation items, uh, or at least right in line with one of the implementation items in the draft GPLCP. Yeah, I, I guess the only thing I'm adding is I was hoping we, you know, we're, we're probably never going to have, you know, a bundle of money that we can easily afford to spend on it. I wonder if we could investigate sort of 
doing it on the cheap and still achieving most of what we wanted to achieve. You know, uh, you know that's a good point, Commissioner Coffey. That might be interesting to have um, Lexi um, from uh, National Estuary Program come and give you a little presentation on eelgrass in the bay and what they've done um, to date and what they found, or at least somebody from the NEP. It doesn't have to be Lexi necessarily, but um, I'd, I'd be happy to reach out and see if she we could set that up so we could have a conversation like that. I think that'd probably be fairly illuminating to the commission. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. I see heads nodding, so I'll see if I can reach out and uh, work something out there. Great, thank That's you. That's like step one in the process, I guess. Uh, Commissioner Roshan. Uh, thank you, Chair Stewart. Um, I'd, uh, I want to follow Joe's lead. Uh, a couple of meetings ago, I talked about doing an information session on trees and planting in uh, Femoral Bay. And um, I've asked for some recommendations. And uh, Betty Winholtz actually suggested um, I contact Hope Merkel at Los Osos Nursery. Uh, her family has run that nursery for 45 years. She's been very involved the whole time. Um, wonderful person. Um, anyway, she's agreed to uh, help us organize a panel. Um, it would involve her, Hope Merkel, Lindsay Best, and they've recommended Mike Bush and John Chestnut. These are all local people, all naturalists. They would, each one uh, would sort of give us 10 minutes on a, a different kind of topic around, around planting and trees and what seems to be most appropriate for Morrill Bay. And it would be just an introduction to the commission as a way to look at these issues. Um, I was going to suggest that we might structure this 10 minutes each for the four speakers, 15 minutes of questions that would give us a 55 minute information session. And I did talk with Scott and it does look like if uh, we're all in favor, we could do this on May 4th. We could get that on the agenda. Got a nod from me. Thank you all very much. I'll circulate uh, bios on the four speakers. And um, Scott, if we could get that on the agenda, it sounds great. Um, I have one more uh, thing I wanted to get on the public record is that I'm uh, very interested and I think other commissioners might be too of a tour of Vistra. And um, I really want to go on that the commission is asking for that. Uh, we don't want it to just wait. Um, we understand the complexity of what's going on, but I think there's a certain urgency that we begin to inform ourselves. And I think it should start with the tour. Very much in favor of that. Me too. Looks like that's, you got. That's all good. We'll be talking with Vista, I think, next week. So um, we'll certainly let them know as part of our kickoff for the environmental uh, work for the uh, uh, Boundary Project. They were planning on doing that anyway, by the way, for those of you that didn't know that. Thank you. All right. Uh, Commissioner Ford. Thank you, Chair Stewart. Um, I actually have a question um, regarding, you know, I, I sit up in my office and I, and I look at the Embarcadero every day and I've noticed that our shipments from trucks to restaurants and stores and whatnot happen to usually drop off right in the middle of like rush hour for lunch and for dinner and for breakfast and all those really unfortunate times blocking traffic. We don't have bike lanes, obviously, so we have bicyclists and trying to navigate through and traffic coming both ways in one lane. And it's a bit of a, a mess. And so um, until we, you know, redo the Embarcadero, if we do eventually redo the Embarcadero, is there a way, um, I know that there's other cities that have limit limitations on delivery times. And I don't know if that's something that the planning commission can even be involved in, but I think that it is definitely something that could lessen the crazy hecticness that occurs down there during this peak times. So yes, that happens um, regularly to drive in the opposite lane or opposing lane of traffic to get around the trucks. Um, we actually have a plan in my office, it's over there, um, that you know puts uh, truck delivery spaces in areas where parking spaces are uh, along the Embarcadero to address that issue, though there is some angst among the business owners down the waterfront about removing parking spaces. 
which I understand. Um, and the other piece of that is we have had con you know conversations with the uh, food vendors that bring food to our restaurants, and um, apparently we're little fish in the sea. And uh, the folks that get to dictate that are the cities that already have those limitations in place, um, and, uh, and they get deliveries before we do. And one of those is the city of San Luis, and there's a couple of others, I guess. And so we've not had much success. We've run down this um, track a few times uh, and really got nowhere with it. Um, which is why we came up with the plan to have loading, uh, you know, truck loading and unloading spaces um, down there to avoid this. Um, but obviously, we haven't moved forward with that either. Um, much because there has been some, there was some pushback when we did it. But the plan that includes that was adopted by council. It's approved by council. I think certainly things for for future discussions. I guess is what it is. <laughs> Okay. I do think it's a challenge because we're sort of at the end of the line too in terms of deliveries. They're going to come up from, most of them up from LA, delivering along their way. And some of our businesses open later too. So it's been an issue and it has been discussed in the business forums as well. So Okay. And then my uh, one follow-up to that also would be, um, I noticed that we don't have bicycle, um, you know, like sharing bicycles spray painted on, I don't know that exact term, but in the lanes that basically notify motorists that you're sharing this lane with cyclists. And I don't know if that's something that, um, you know, we could add or uh, just make people more, especially tourists, more aware that we don't have a bicycle lane that is, you know, I mean, I'm watching cyclists all the time, you know, bobbing through traffic or using our sidewalks, um, which is also an issue. So um, just anything that just makes people more aware, um, I think can help. I don't, I, hopefully we haven't had a lot of incidences of cyclists being hit, but um, just, you know, I'd like to prevent that from happening in the future. So. Yeah, we haven't had many. Uh, you know, we do have shares throughout town. Um, so, are there specific areas where you're you were looking to have them, or just in general? Well, in general, but I think also on the Embarcadero, at least between. Gosh, I'm trying to think of the streets that I'm looking at here. Uh, is it Harbor and Marina? I think it is. But there's, I don't see any markings in the lanes, you know, and I'm talking about the ones that like show the bicycle and like the arrow, like you're sharing this lane with cyclists. The share arrow. It's, it's a share arrow, yeah. I, I'm certainly yeah. happy to talk with um, our city engineer on it though. I'll ask him about it. I, I don't know what, I don't know, yeah. where, I don't know what, um, I don't know what, I mean, we have them in different places around town and I don't really know how those locations were chosen versus others. I don't, I don't know how that was done. So I'll at least go find out for it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Anything else? I want to put out there real quick. I listened to a really great podcast on roundabouts. Um, it was freakonomics.com slash podcast slash roundabouts. I would recommend everybody um, in Morro Bay and on this commission take a listen to it. Um, like many of the Freakonomics radio stuff, it's it's interesting and very accessible. Um, but also some great um, statistics, information, background history on um, both safety and environmental issues um, regarding roundabouts. And since we may be looking at one eventually going in, at least one um, at 41 and uh, Main Street, um, I think the public could maybe get more of a feeling of comfort about it um, or at least help them develop their opinions with more of an educated background about it. And um, perhaps that's something I can send to Scott and he can share around. Um, sure. But it, it, um, I did share it with um, another uh, business group I'm in and Janice Peters, who of course was instrumental in getting our current roundabout said, I wish I had had this information, you know, when she was fighting for that for a good four or five or six years. So um, I would recommend that. And I'm sure there's lots more, but I think we can probably move on to community development director comments. Yeah, so um, at our next meeting, you know, we're going to have the election of officers. We need to, you know, have a new for chair and vice chair um, with Jesse's leaving. Um, we're hopefully opening up the recruitment to replace them. I thought that was going to happen already, but it, 
hasn't yet. Um, so hopefully it's coming out soon. Um, that's done by the city clerk's office, not, not my department. Um, you do have coming before you, the next meeting is going to be the appeal for 2460 Maine. That's the supportive care project that's generated a lot of uh, interest in the city. Um, so I just wanted you to be aware of that, that is coming. Um, uh, and uh, and probably gonna give some thoughts to, uh, you know, how we manage the meeting, you know, on Zoom and probably make sure we use the, um, Timer. The timer that I have that I can that I can share my screen on, so you can see, so we can see it, and you know, and we'll have the the, the notification for the um, for public comment on there. So we'll keep that up with the timer, kind of like council does uh, at the meeting, and for that entire comment period, just so that it's there for everybody, and that the timer's there and you can see, and whoever's running the meeting can see it. Um, and I'm going to bring forward the um, some, uh, previous uh, future agenda item. Um, I think I mentioned this to you maybe previously, but um, the review of the Mora Bay Elementary School special use permit. Um, I, uh, you know, was able to get in contact with the school district. Uh, Ryan Pinkerton, uh, you know, forwarded me the uh, the plan um, that really is just the list of uh, uses they have out there and kind of a you know a, a site plan that shows where they're at, kind of color coded sort of. Um, and so I'll bring that forward to you um, in. Based on the, I was going to bring it at the last meeting, and then realized too late that it, the requirement of the ordinance is that the review has to be a public hearing. Um, to say you have, we go overboard in the review of the uses that are out there is an understatement. But um, so I have noticed it sent to the paper today, so you'll have it. Uh, so we'll be re reviewing that at the next meeting, and you can see the uses. Um, I don't imagine it'd be a real long item. There's not a bunch of uses out there, so but certainly conversation worth having since we're supposed to review it biannually and we've never reviewed it since it was issued um, many years ago. So, Scott, do you get the sense that the school district is planning to come before the city, whether the commission, council, the general public at any point? to discuss their project and their plans? So we've sat down with them a couple of different times. You know, they're they're just, they're just like we are, right? You know, they're they're a public agency. So any everything that they do is out in the is out in the is out for public consumption. So when you sit down with the school board and and, and they and staff goes, "Well, do you want us to look at other uses for this for the school site?" and the school board says, "Yes." Well, then you go off and go do that, and then you have to bring it back to them and show it to them before you really show it to anybody else, because the school district then has to say, "Yeah, we're interested in that," or "No, that's not that doesn't make any sense." You know, you know, you don't just randomly run out and show it to the community, get them all wound up about something that the district hasn't told you, the school board hasn't told you to go do. So that's kind of what they found themselves in. You know, it's kind of a little bit of a catch twenty two. You know, you really would rather be out in front of it, talking with the community, but they really couldn't do that um, because they didn't have any direction other than like, hey, bring back some information to the um, to the school board, which is what they did. And everybody picked it up and was like, oh my God, this is crazy, or this is a good project, or it's not, whatever. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, they've they got it to a point where they were getting ready to start looking at all this. They said they came in, sat down, met with myself, met with the city manager. Um, you know, we kind of went through, you know, what they were doing, what they were looking at, and then COVID hit. Literally, that was one of the last meetings I think we had in the conference room in the city at City Hall. Um, and um, and so they've you know they've been focused on trying to get their schools open. I mean, literally, that's been the plan, and you know how they how they go about doing that. They just don't have enough capacity to do everything at once. So um, they haven't come back. I would imagine you know once everything's kind of calmed down a little bit, they will um, because they did get the direction to sort of move it to the next step, and that would be the engagement. And that's what we told them we needed was you need to come and engage the community now and. You know, that's when they kind of gave us the, you know, the, the speech that I gave you is that, you know, we're kind of stuck. We, we apologize that we got people wound up. We didn't mean to, but um, we really had to get direction from the board before we could do anything. So. Right. Okay. Thank you. Sure. All right. Then it looks like we are ready to adjourn this meeting at 718. Our next meeting will be April 20th at 6 p.m. And until further, further notice, it's still via teleconference. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Chair Stewart. Very good meeting. <laughs> yeah, thank you all. Have a good Thanks night, everybody. Thank you. Too.